Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I have to show you our safe harbor statement. You've probably seen these before. Basically, we're going to show you some stuff that's in research, some experimental stuff. Uh, that's uh, not to say that those, that is no promise that they will end up in product, so I've got to legally say that. Um, all right, uh, my name is Evan Atherton. I'm a senior research engineer for Autodesk Research in the AI and Robotics Lab. And today, my colleagues and I are going to share some of the work we've been doing at Autodesk to leverage AI in both the tools we make today, as well as looking at how to use it to kind of change the way designers and artists are going to work in the future. So I want to start by just setting some high-level context about where we see the role of AI in the design process. So this uh, super scientific and definitely accurate graph shows the complexity of our world over time. So as our world becomes more complex, the problems we need to solve become more complex, and therefore the tools that we need to solve those problems also become more complex. So to illustrate the point, imagine you've never seen a hammer and you've never seen a chisel. If you walked into a room and saw someone doing this, I think it would take everyone in here probably 15 seconds to figure out what the problem was and what the tool does, right? So you might take the blunt thing and hit the, hit the sharp pointy thing and some wood goes flying off. Uh, so super simple problem, super simple tool. Now let's say you walked into a room and you saw a wood lathe. So the problem is similar, but a little bit more complex. So you still wanna remove some wood, but you wanna do it on this cylindrical object that's spinning, and maybe you want a more ornate pattern. So you think, all right, I can do this. Let me put the like, cylindrical thing and the spinny thing and turn it on and take a chisel to it, but then maybe wood goes flying, chisel goes flying, hit someone in the head. It's kind of a mess. So um, you have to start understanding things like grain direction and spindle speed and things like that. So maybe the machine takes more, more maintenance. So the problem you're trying to solve has become more complex. And again, the tool uh, that we've created to solve that problem also has become more complex. But it's still within our ability as humans to grasp that. Like if, if any of us spent enough time in a room with a wood lathe, we, we'd sort of figure it out. But unfortunately, our ability as humans to manage this changing complexity, this increasing complexity, uh, is actually finite. So our brains, unfortunately, don't benefit from Moore's Law, for instance. Uh, so to take our analogy home, let's look at a CNC machine. So this is a massively more complex machine. It could take months of, trainings to become, months of training to become proficient at. Um, if you've ever seen G-code or had to write G-code by hand, it's pretty gnarly. Um, but humans have developed software techniques that manage a lot of that complexity for us, that write the G-code for us and control the machine for us. Um, so that lets us as designers and engineers to leverage this complex tool to make more and more complex parts. So this space between these two curves here is where we think the really profound impact of AI is going to be. So there will come a point on this curve beyond which we won't be able to solve problems without it. So what we want to do is use AI to create tools that understand what we're trying to accomplish and can then augment our abilities so that together we can solve problems that may be otherwise impossible for either of us to do on, on our own. It's hard to see, but that's a VCR clock trying to be set. Um, I feel like I'm barely old enough to still make that joke. Um, so the way we think this is going to happen is in three phases. So the first phase is what we're calling smart tools. So these are tools that, on the surface, don't really seem that much different to interact with. Um, than the tools we're already using. So there might be single push button automations, um, but on the back end, uh, what's going on is, is wildly different. So these are tools that use mountains and mountains of data to train algorithms that help solve the problems for us. And they're able to solve problems that are tedious, super time consuming, and also problems that we just, to this day, haven't been able to solve. And what's cool about them is they can continue to collect data as we use them and refine themselves and get better and better. Um, so this is actually the stage we're in right now. Uh, the next stage, which I think is close, uh, is what we're calling intelligent assistance. So these are tools that will actually learn who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. And they'll be able to reason about the actions that we need to take to help achieve our goals. So if you're an architect, for instance, and you need to lay out an office, you don't need to be pushing polygons around, right? That's not the problem. The problem is, how do I balance the needs and requirements of the people in the room? So why not have a tool that lets you balance the needs and requirements of the people in our room? 
so because of that, the types of interactions we're gonna have with our tools fundamentally has to start changing so that we can represent what our goals are. And finally, the thir third phase is when our tools become truly trusted collaborators. So this is when they'll not just understand our, our goals, but they'll understand the context that we're working in. Uh, so they'll help us achieve our goals, but beyond that, they'll be able to give us insights to make sure that the goals we're trying to achieve are actually the right goals. And again, the experience of working with the tools in this stage is, is gonna change. This, in this stage, we're gonna have interactions with our machines that are much closer to how we interact with other humans than how we interact with, uh, with the tools we have today. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Will, who's gonna share some of the work that's already making its way into product. Thank you, Evan. Uh, so I'm uh, Will Harris, uh, product manager here at Autodesk uh, for the Flame family of products. And if you haven't heard of Flame, it is a, uh, what we call a nonlinear editor or a video editing tool that is also able to do visual facts compositing, has a procedural node graph, and also has a 3D scene environment for motion graphics and 3D scene compositing and also does color grading. So it's kind of a suite of tools that you might use. It's kind of like a Mac Daddy version of Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro if you're familiar with those. Uh, so with that as our background, we have been doing a lot of uh, solving of problems um, in, in the world of uh, v visual effects compositing and trying to do image segmentation. And so, so our AI, if you like, are, has been focused towards image processing. So you might think of, you, know, you, you might, th your first thought for AI might be to do with you know, Google predicting what you're, gonna, what you're gonna search or picking, picking which images in this authentication image are traffic lights or crosswalks. Uh, but our approach was very specific to the problems that we face and I guess complexity that's outside our reach, um, like, like Evan was saying earlier, um, in compositing and in working with images. So this, this uh, illustration really brings in the idea that in a, in a CG render world, you have, as well as a beauty image of your spaceships that you want to composite, you also have uh, AOVs or render passes, arbitrary output variables, that are, um, that are more informant, they're rich, asset types, if you like, or they're, they're things that can allow you to apply depth of field, defocus through, through Z-depth, and normals to potentially relight those spaceships post-render. That richness um, is something where we have nothing on our backplate, right? So there's no such level of asset. There's no AOV for my camera shot scene shot on Sony or ARRI or traditional cameras uh, today. What if we could bring and generate that detail of asset for live action. So enter, enter AI. What we really need is, we sometimes joke, AIVs. And here you have some examples of what our, our research led to. So applied research, uh, problem specific to this issue of image processing. We wanted to be able to generate depth for a, for a live action scene so that we could uh, brighten or darken the background, add light in the foreground. And we want to be able to generate uh, normals for human faces, but not CG rendered human faces. We want the equivalent asset for live action content. So the power of normals brought to working with live action content. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let's, just, let's just have a look at how an artist actually uses it. We want to, some, in some ways, try to do VFX at the speed of grading. That's what we sometimes call this. And you can see how, through the kind of mechanism that you might associate with doing color grading, like keying and, and doing, doing a track on a shot, uh, we, can, we can come right in here and quickly generate normals. And then, and then from that, we can use a, a widget like this to then change the lighting on a face. So this is really a, a powerful, um, new way that, that you know, an, an AI tool, a, a push button automaton, as we said earlier, has brought us. There's nothing to do, there's no, there's no special knowledge needed, but there's no way you could paint or build the complexity of a normal map for a human face 
Um, it, it, would be, it would take months to, uh, to build this asset, right? Uh, and from it, so you can quickly generate a mat that then you could use for color adjustment. We could also, you know, have a, have a, uh, to be able to defocus the background or change the lighting in the background as well, based on depth. So in this second example, what we have actually is, uh, is the, the depth. So doing global analysis for the scene, it doesn't have to be a traditional camera trackable scene. It can be blurry, handheld. It's using the intelligence of our training to know things like the sky is typically at the top of the image and at the back. The foreground is typically you know, closer at the, lo the lower part of the image. And there's blobs of things that are going to move around in the midground uh, from the hundreds of thousands of images that we trained it with. So this you know, quickly can lead you then to be able to uh, re-light re the background, add light in the background. Something that would have been historically, okay, I have to rotoscope all these people by hand or with maybe some, some traditional pixel-based keying. Uh, but through having this, this richness, you can start doing the kind of thing that you would do if this was a, a CG rendered scene. Okay. So just to, just to summarize, uh, we, we, we took our applied research. Uh, we've, we've built these tensor graphs um, uh, that, that have then you know, been, been computed, computed into algorithms or trained models. Uh, that was a big process that was done in part of our development. We then packaged that into a tool inside the Flame software itself to allow our artists to get quick and easy access to that to be able to do some of the cleverness of VFX, but in, for example, here, uh, you know, some color, the color grading discipline. Um, we, we think that that's a great symbiosis, as we said, um, and we would just like to uh, let you know that you know, we think this is just the, the beginning of, uh, of, of AI tools for us. We're already starting to think about other specialized trainings like uh, uh, being able to extract sky, just sky, so when you understand depth, be able to key the sky in different types of environments. There's a lot of our customers are, are doing, uh, you know, replacing um, overcast skies with nice puffy clouds or removing clouds or adding clouds or matching one sky from one shot to another. So having an auto Kia, an automaton Kia for that we think would be good. But we're looking for feedback into what other specializations would be good as well. Uh, do you need to be able to isolate buildings? Do you need to be able to up-res your footage? Uh, that there's AI that can do uh, pixel up-resing, right? And then the last thing to mention, if you're a larger company, um, for, for if you have teams that would, would actually like to utilize this framework and have specialized data sets, uh, excuse me, give us specialized data sets that we could then build you a... Uh, uh, a, a way to recognize a certain kind of character. If you have a whole bunch of movies coming up with one type of character, that might be useful. Um, and so this is a framework that we built that we think could, could be specialized. If you'd like to hear more about this, please join me tomorrow at 4.30. I've got a special guest, uh, Stefan from A52, one of our most uh, cool and innovative customers to show some of his real work uh, from this. With that, let me, let me hand you over to Seb. Bastien, thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Cool stuff. Um, okay. So I'm Sebastian. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Autodesk, and I work with products like 3ds Max and Maya. And today, I'm going to talk about this product that we call UVAI. So as a refresher, um, for those of you who don't know what uh, UV mapping is, so traditionally, uh, when you wa want to texture a 3D model, uh, that texture is defined in 2D. And UV mapping is simply the process of establishing the correspondence between the 3D model and the 2D image. This process is usually done in three steps. In the first step, we're going to add seams to the model, uh, therefore uh, separating the model in different pieces that we call UV shells or UV islands. Then we're going to unwrap each of those shells so that they're flat, and in the final step, we're gonna lay those shells out in the UV space, typically in one or more uh, square, uh, square UV pieces. This is an important problem because it's taking our customers 40 to 60% of the asset creation time. And it's been a top 10 customer request uh, for my N3ds Max for more than three years. 
And it turns out that we have pretty good tools to do automatic unwrapping and layout, but we don't have uh, very good tools to do automatic seams. So let's take a step back to understand why do we need seams and why they're hard. Imagine you have a sphere where you want to place a map of the world. Um, you could add a single seam, a vertical seam, and you will get a nice square um, UV shell. But you will notice that around um, the equator, there's a lot of stretching, which is represented by red. And around the poles, you will find a lot of compression, which is represented by blue. Now, you could also add more seams, therefore generating more shells, which uh, will lead you to less uh, distortion, uh, which is why all these shells are mostly white. But then imagine uh, having a texture of the world split like this. It might be hard to work on and hard to understand. There's more. So the first layout that I showed you is very efficient because it's taking all that square. It's almost leaving no gaps. Whereas the second one is leaving many little gaps in between. And that's very important uh, in video games, for example, where every megabyte counts. In addition to the geometric and optimization uh, constraints, uh, seams are also used to create semantic boundaries. And that's because these UV maps are going to be used by a texture artist down the pipeline, and it's useful if they can identify the parts of the model easily. So you can see here that there's a, a head shell, there is a torso uh, and legs, uh, arms, etc. So we've seen uh, three main characteristics. So uh, seams are used to reduce distortion, they define semantic boundaries, and they also influence an efficient layout. Unfortunately, when you add seams to a model, you're most likely going to add uh, some visual artifacts around those seams. So it might be a little bit hard to see the visual artifact in the image to the right. I don't know if anyone can see it. So let's zoom in. So you can see that there's a discontinuity on both sides of the seam. And you might think, well, this is OK, because I'm looking at this asset from afar. But on a video game where you can get close to this character, or in a movie where you're filming this character from behind, this is going to break the illusion. Which is why artists will most often place their seams in non-apparent places, uh, such as under the arms, or between the legs, or on the back. Now, when we compare what an artist would generate, uh, where they would place their seams with our current uh, auto UV or the seam tools, we can see that uh, our auto seam tool is preserving a good distortion, but it's not preserving the semantic boundaries again. So it's very hard for me to see what parts of the model are represented where in the UV space. But artists have been doing this for years and years, and so maybe a geometric approach is not the best approach to produce automatic seams. What if instead we could leverage the knowledge of artists and use all these models that they have already created, feed that into a machine learning algorithm, and let it learn and let it produce seams? So this is exactly what we did for this early prototype. I want to emphasize this is a very early prototype in Maya. Um, and here the artist is just going to, with one click, generate the, the, the seams, one click uh, do the unwrapping, and two clicks the layout. So first they click on AI seams, they wait for a little bit while the seams are calculated. Now that they get good seams, they're gonna select the model, unfold it, unfold all the shells, finally orient and layout. So in just three clicks, they uh, got pretty decent UVs. How does this compare to what the artist had imagined originally? Well. We have a very uh, similar distortion and a similar number of UV shells, so the, there's similar fragmentation. Uh, but more importantly, we're preserving, again, these semantic boundaries. So you can see that uh, there's a shell for the head, there's a shell for uh, the torso and the legs, there's, a sh there's two shells for the arms. But then you might be wondering, well, the layout there doesn't quite look as the layout from the artist, the ground truth uh, layout. Um, uh, yes. But that's because we're not predicting uh, the unwrapping and we're not predicting the layout. Only the this, only this seams for now. And we're still working on perfecting this seam prediction. 
but we're already thinking of what's next for this project. So first of all, um, it's, it's this idea of generalization. We have tested on a few categories like characters and vehicles, but there's so many more assets that are placed in a 3D world. There's vegetation, buildings, um, furniture, and we want to support all of these assets in our system. There's style transfer, which is very similar to what uh, Will mentioned at the end. Maybe you're a big studio or an artist that has tons of assets, and you already have your own seam style that you want to apply to new assets that you create. You want to transfer your style. We want to enable this workflow. And inevitably, when you have an automatic system, there might be things that you don't like from the result, and you might want to do some tweaks, but you want the system to remember those tweaks for the next time. And so that's the idea of personalization that we also want to enable. And finally, one of the biggest complaints of machine learning is that um, it's very hard to, to control the output that it generates. So we want to, to give artists some guidance, um, or, or allow artists to guide the process, rather, um, by, for example, adding initial seams and let the system take it from there or blocking certain regions that would usually have seams so that the system does not generate seams there. And with that, uh, I want to leave it uh, back to Evan, who's going to talk about all the great work they do at Autodesk Research. Thank you. Hello again. <laughs> Uh, so, as promised, I'd like to share some of the work we've been doing uh, in Autodesk Research. It's a little bit further out there, uh, but where, it's, where we're really trying to explore uh, what I mentioned er earlier about leveraging AI to com uh, create completely new design paradigms. Uh, and to help us start moving that, toward that vision of that the trusted collaborator. Uh, the first project I want to talk about is called DeepForm. And what we're trying to do with DeepForm is try to use machine learning to essentially parameterize the essence of an object. So we want to learn what are the key features that make something an airplane or a guitar or a table. And the way we're doing that is uh, by showing a network, in this case using autoencoders if you're interested, um, a bunch of pictures of airplanes, um, and then it's able to encode its airplaneness, uh, for lack of a better word, <laughs> as a vector of numbers. Uh, so it's essentially compressing what it means to be an airplane or guitar or table into something, into a string of numbers that we can then represent as a 3D point cloud. So this is real output from that network. Uh, so in this case, what it thinks a laptop is. What it thinks a vase is. So it's really cool about doing this. Um, when we get a basically a vector of numbers that can represent an object, we can then add and subtract objects the same way we add and subtract numbers. Uh, so this is what we call the cheroplane. Uh, so here we're finding all of the objects that exist between a chair and an airplane. So that's kind of a cute example, but uh, for something more practical, we can actually take two objects of a similar class and interpolate between those to find all sorts of design variations in between, perhaps variations that, that we might not have thought of. So here's real output from the network as we interpolate between a table on the left that has no base and then the table on the right that has the base. Um, so you can see this computing. But we can actually go beyond just like a straight linear interpolation uh, between two objects and we can actually control individual features. Uh, so for a chair, a feature might be the style of the legs or the style of the back or whether or not uh, you have armrests or the hole in the back. Uh, so again, here's some real output. Um, this time we're taking a vase that has sort of a lip at the top, pretty curvy. We're subtracting a vase that doesn't have a lip at the top, and then we're adding a vase that has straight sides. And the result you see here is a vase that has sort of a lip at the top and straight sides. So what this approach ultimately lets us do is draw from the massive body of knowledge and design language that already exists. Um, and that lets us push our designs further faster, and it also lets us come up with, again, some maybe perhaps designs that, that we wouldn't have considered on our own. 
Uh, we can also use this approach um, to help build tools to help people learn. Uh, so we've been doing some experiments with Tinkercad. If you're not familiar with Tinkercad, it's a online web-based uh, CAD tool that's uh, free, so a lot, of, a lot of kids and hobbyists use it. Um, and because of that, it's a really important, learning is a really important part of the Tinkercad platform. Um, so it has millions of users who've generated a ton of public data that we've been able to mine. Um, and essentially what we're doing is learning what types of models people are creating and then how they create them. So after a while, the, the algorithm has sort of learned to predict uh, what people are trying to make, and it's continually updating. So you can see down there, it's, it's a continual update of what it thinks you're trying to make. In this case, it thinks the person wants to make a fidget spinner. Um, and then it's also able to understand, uh, if you're trying to make a certain object, it can understand the steps that you might need to take uh, to get to that object and, and provide those suggestions uh, to, to you so that, that you can then use those to learn, um, learn how you might design an object. So you can see now just by adding the block on the back, you get uh, things you want to make an airplane. So uh, switching gears a little bit, um, the last thing I want to share with you is something that we spend a lot of time on, uh, and that's simulation. So simulation is in all of our tools, super powerful, uh, but it's really hard to use. And more than anything, simulations just take forever. Um, they take a long time to set up, and then they're really computationally expensive, so they can just take a long time to compute, which makes it really hard to iterate. So often, you might try to set up a simulation, and then you have to go get a coffee um, or whatever, and then you come back, and then maybe your simulation didn't work the way you wanted it to. Um, so this is true whether or not you're doing like computational fluid dynamics of flow through a pipe, or an explosion for visual effect. Uh, so here's an example of a finite element problem, which is often used in uh, mechanical product design uh, to calculate the static stress on an object. Uh, so this is a couple of cylinders. On the left, we have a boundary condition. So the left of the cylinder is, is attached to a wall. The green arrow here is uh, basically a force vector. And what you see on the, the right here is uh, we're using AI to approximate the uh, the simulation calculation, and we're able to do that in around four milliseconds. So what this enables us to do is adjust the design in real time and see, see the updated uh, simulation results as, as we do that. So we can have a more interactive approach to, to designing and simulating kind of at the same time. I'll also add that as geometry gets more complex, uh, typical numerical approaches to simulation tend to uh, increase the time it takes to calculate exponentially. Uh, this isn't true of these AI techniques. Um, so as this geometry gets more complex, it should stay um, computing on the order of, of the milliseconds. Uh, we've also done this with computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so these types of simulations typically are solving like crazy nonlinear partial differential equations and stuff. Uh, they're super gnarly. So uh, what you see here is actually, again, an approximation in this case of laminar flow over this object um, that's updating in, in real time. You can see 60 frames per second up there as the, as the object is being manipulated. So these are pretty like hardcore engineering problems, uh, but they're essentially the same problems that, that we face with uh, effect simulations and, and tools like Maya. And you can also see here on the right just the, the amount of parameters an artist has to play with. So especially if you're a new artist, you might not know the effect that, that some of these are gonna have, so you can burn a lot of time up front trying to set up a simulation that won't end up giving you uh, the result that you're looking for. So I'll leave you with sort of a, sort of a what if. Um, what if we could just show Maya a ton of simulations and then it could use, use all that information to essentially learn how to use itself and form some intuition so that it can do what artists do all the time, which is take some piece of reference photography or footage and then use that intuition it's formed to perhaps suggest the bifrost graph you might need to get started um, to, to get you that, that simulation recreated in 3D that you can then manipulate. So again, the goal is, is not to replace the artist, rather it's, it's to augment their abilities so that they can start further faster so they're not faced with sort of the, the, the blank page and they can spend more time on the artistry of it and less, less on the setting it up. I've never met an artist who just like finished their sim early and was like chilling, right? <laughs> so, um, and uh, so with that, like 
that's, these are really complicated problems. Um, so I wanted to, to leave you with just three main challenges we see um, in leveraging AI for this type of work. Uh, the first of which is identifying problems suited to the technology. And I mean this in two ways. One is um, often uh, in, in pop culture, AI is, is presented as something that is just like magical that you can sprinkle on something and just call it a day. Um, but there are certain types of problems that are better suited to these uh, AI techniques, machine learning techniques, um, than others. And then the second way I mean this is that we want to make sure that we're solving problems that our users care about. Um, and that can help them do their jobs better and faster. Uh, the second major challenge, and this is true for any AI practitioner, um, is, is getting good data. So in fact, if you have a inferior neural network that's trained on more and better data, it will often outperform superior networks um, that's, that's trained on, on worse data. Um, so the higher quality data, the more, more of it you have, the better your algorithms will be. Uh, which finally brings me to, uh, we don't believe any one group will be able to solve some of, these, some of the toughest challenges um, with these design problems using AI. Uh, we have ball and researchers, but no one understands your workflows better than you do. No one has better data than the companies that are using our tools day in and day out to create magic on the screen. So. Uh, we're looking to par partner with groups and help people solve, um, solve these really challenging problems. So if that sounds rad and you want to talk to us about it, maybe get some more information about, um, about what we can do, shoot us an email at ai at autodesk.com. Come talk to us after. Um, and yeah, that's it. I think we'll, we'll take a couple questions. And thank you. Thank you so much. It was really inspiring. And uh, when you talk about like airplaneness of the object, uh, you consider scene analyzing like whole thing for, for example, emotionness or composition correctness or some following some rules of this scene analyzing, which is cause. Uh, some render recommendation how to light this scene uh, to make it more impression or neutral. So uh, not the only object analyzing, but scene itself. Or for example, you can analyze the render logs and uh, predict uh, light setup or render time or something like this. A more global level of render analyzing. So it looks like uh, like life analyzing itself, but uh, it's really very inspiring, your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, sure. no, you had another question? Any other questions? Go ahead. OK, uh, yes. Looking farther ahead, do you see a space for AI to collaborate with humans on things that are at more higher semantic levels, like the story and the emotion that the artist is trying to communicate. And this might get into automating the blocking of the characters, the movement of the camera, the composition of the camera shots. Do you see a need for AI assist at these higher storytelling levels? Uh, absolutely, and I, I will say that uh, I actually have a, an intern right now as a PhD uh, researcher uh, who's in the lab right now trying to figure out how we can use machine learning to map cinematography styles. Uh, it's really the, the early stages of that. So I think when we start to talk about things like emotion, that's a, that's a little bit harder. Um, but uh, we can start by giving creatives tools so that they can explore these spaces a little better. And maybe you do have a camera shot um, and maybe uh, if, if trained on enough data, we can start to see clusterings of camera movement that feels to us uh, more anxious. And then they could, they could pick one of those uh, camera sort of features and, and add it to their, their camera. So I absolutely think that's, that's where we're going and where I'd like to see us head. We can all make it look like J.J. Abrams. Yeah, basically. Um, <laughs> um, and that's not to say that, like, you know, I, I certainly don't want to replace like cinematographers, and I don't think that's what a tool like this would do. Um, but again, just having having an assistant that that can help you out and explore 
um, explore these different types of um, shot styles in your, for your specific question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, I was wondering for the UV, UV AI project, uh, the type of models you were using to handle the 3D data. Um, we're still we're still sort of developing uh, our models, so we cannot talk too much about them yet. So, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Is there any kind of rough estimate when technology like this will become available for artists to use? Like just rough like, is it coming maybe in a few years? Is it coming sooner than that? I, I think we showed like the three, you know, the three futures kind of, so flame. Yeah, the, the stuff that's already shipping is what I was showing there. Um, and then I guess yours is sort of a active research yeah, I think like uh, looking. yeah, Auto, Autodesk stuff aside, I think we're already starting to see, um, as certainly in the last year, more more papers being written on tools for creatives. Um, seeing more examples, um, I think there's one from Google um, that's music related, so um, mu music generators and things like that. So I think it's in some ways like we're already there. Um, for the for the further vision, like the stuff um, that I showed, like manipulating objects, I think we're a little bit further out. I he I always hesitate to give time ranges, but uh, five to ten years, somewhere someone on that order. Yeah. Very exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Shall we? Well, we'll we'll stick around if anyone has individual questions for us. Uh, one okay. more question. Well, well, yeah. yeah, one more. Uh, Go ahead. One more we just can't see him very well. Uh, <laughs> there was an interesting research about Vimeo. Uh, they 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 took the they feed the comments about videos to the neural network, and they got uh, like recommendation how to make video better or how to make like most emotional impact of the spectacular, and it looks like it's kind of manipulation start to be. So uh, what do you think about that uh, with developing these tools, we can easily manipulate spectacular in, the, in some ways. Uh, it's like we can, we can like push him to feel something or <laughs> to go in some direction. So what is your personal opinion? It's good that we're not in the social media business yeah. on yeah. the desk. Uh, we just make creative tools for people <laughs> to, to make cool cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, certainly for stuff like maybe nonlinear editors, there's room for, you know, if I have a ton of footage that we shot and I just want to see a quick assembly edit, you know, can we yep. show can we show that tool a, um, a script, yes. have it understand like sort of the, the feeling that's in that particular scene and then just cut together a quick trailer or cut together a quick sequence uh, from, from that footage. Well, we've, we've had customers request us uh, you know, grouping shots, so like all the shots of this actor that need the beauty work, we wish we could scan our entire movie and find the, the 500 shots that have that person in. Yeah. Uh, would be another scenario we might use. This feels related, but just this morning, I think I read uh, or saw, saw an article that um, someone trained an AI to watch all of the Queer Eye for the Straight Guy episodes and then write an episode based on that. Um, so you see, see that kind of stuff like happening already. Yeah, that's a semantic at that point, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool, all right, no one's popping up, so maybe we'll hang out. We got a couple minutes, we can hang out and answer, answer some questions uh, if you're interested. Thanks for coming, thanks for sticking around. Thank you. Thank you.